Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is David Robinson, he, him, his, and I'm the Director of Membership and Meetings for the Linguistic Society of America, which is sponsoring this webinar. While I'm talking, you'll be seeing a brief slideshow about the LSA and what we do. And on the last slide, you'll see information about a special membership discount for participants in this webinar. We're excited to present this webinar, an open access primer, as a service to our members and to the linguistics community at large. And we're especially grateful to Lauren Collister and the LSA's Committee on Scholarly Communication and Linguistics for proposing and organizing the webinar, and to all of our panelists for contributing their time and knowledge. Um, the LSA is a leading open access publisher. All of our publications, with the exception of our flagship journal Language, are fully open access. And Language itself follows a delayed open access model, meaning that all content becomes fully open, fully open access one year after publication or earlier on payment of a modest article processing charge. I'd like, like to take a few moments right now to let you know how the webinar will work and to make sure you're familiar with the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, first of all, you'll see a handouts widget on your control panel. In there, we have copies of the panelists' slides, which you can download at any time during the webinar. And we'll also make them available on the LSA website next week. And I've included in the handouts a document listing all of the LSA's open access initiatives. You may have noticed that your microphones are muted. This is so that we don't get miscellaneous background noise, um, traffic, pets, and, and whatnot from all of the participants. When it comes time for question and answer, um, you'll see a uh, little icon to the left of the control panel that has a, a hand. And that will enable you to raise your hand virtually. And when you do that, I will enable your microphone so that you can ask your question. And if your question is for a specific panelist, please uh, specify which one. And finally, I'd like to run a very quick poll to help our panelists gauge how familiar the audience is with the principles and use of open access. I'll start the poll uh, momentarily. And if you can just take a moment to answer, um, once everyone has answered, I will um, by the results for everybody. So hang on. All right, here's the poll. So please go ahead and uh, fill it out. I think almost everybody has voted, so let's go ahead and so I'm going to close the poll and display it for, here we go, and you should be able to um, see the results now, 21% um, novice, 64% somewhat familiar, 14% very familiar, and 0% pro. Okay, great. Um, so now I would like to turn the floor over to Lauren Collister of the University of Pittsburgh. She is chair of the LSA's Committee on Scholarly Communication and Linguistics. Lauren will take you through the basics of open access and her co-panelists, Matt Gordon of the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Eric Bakovich of the University of California, San Diego, will discuss respectively identifying open access journals and making open access part of your scholarly practice. So, moment. Lauren, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, so take it away. David, I believe you're still showing the poll results, and I think you need to hide that, and then I can right. share my screen. Okay, good. Hidden that. Small technical difficulties. Okay. I think everybody can see my screen now, so I'll just pull my slides up. Just give me a moment. So my name is Lauren Collister, and I'm the Director of the Office of Scholarly Communication and Publishing at the University Library System at the University of Pittsburgh. And I, as David said, I'm the Chair of the Committee on Scholarly Communication and Linguistics, and I am also a sociolinguist myself. So I'm going to start off our session today with a primer on open access, giving the basics, the definition, and getting you set up to start having those broader conversations about open access. So 
I have to mention that this is Open Access Week. This uh, webinar is taking place uh, on the Friday of Open Access Week. Open Access Week is an international celebration of open access that takes place the last full week of October every year. There are events all over the world that you can view and join in some cases at openaccessweek.org. There are also a number of really amazing blog posts this year that surround this question that is currently on the screen, which is open for whom? Equity and open knowledge. So this question centers around how do we enable broader participation in scholarship? And I really recommend checking out the blog post at openaccessweek.org, especially once you're uh, totally familiar with open access and become pros after you uh, participate in this webinar. So again, this is this webinar is sponsored and brought to you by the Committee on Scholarly Communication and Linguistics, also known as CoSkill. You can follow this link here to find out more about what we do, and we're also looking for new members. So if you like open access, if you like sharing and communicating research, and if you think this is interesting, this might be the committee for you. So as I mentioned, I will start with open access basics, and then we'll talk more about publishing open access and incorporating more open into your scholarship. So let's ask a very basic question. What is open access? A lot of people have heard the term open access before. It gets thrown around a lot, but not often defined. And sometimes even when it is defined, it's defined in a very confusing way. So I really prefer this definition from SPARC, which is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. This is the definition on the screen. Basically, open access is the free, immediate, online availability of research articles, and crucially, also the right to use and reuse these articles fully. What does that mean? What does that translate to? Open access means that works of scholarship are free for anybody in the world to read, share, reuse, and build upon. It doesn't require a subscription, it doesn't require you to pay any money to get access to it, or to be affiliated with a major institution. If you're a student or a scholar or a faculty member or staff member at a major research university, you likely have a library that pays subscriptions for you so that you can have access to all the journals, all the books that you need. But for those who are between positions or who have just graduated or who work for industry or who pursue scholarship beyond the bounds of a university in some way, oftentimes the work that you need to do that research is just not available or it's available for a very expensive fee. So open access refers to making scholarship available for anybody to use. Um, and I really like this quote at the bottom from Richard Stallman that open access is free as in speech, not as in free beer, as in you need to do something to get it. Some things that are often called open access include journal articles, book chapters, monographs or books, and conference proceedings. So these are the more typical traditional scholarly outputs that were once available in print, but now can be made available online. Many times these are published behind a subscription paywall, but when they're open access, it means they're free for anybody to read, retain, reuse, build upon, etc. Now, you might hear open access in some other contexts as well. There are some allied concepts to open access. That includes open data, which refers to data sets big or small, as well as open education. This refers to teaching materials and pedagogy, and including in that open textbooks, which are textbooks that are, in fact, open access. They are free to read, reuse, uh, transform, build upon, et cetera. Open source is another allied concept, which refers to software or code that is, again, free to read, keep, and reuse. And then, and uh, the broader concept, so open access falls under an umbrella term that's known as open science or open research, which refers to the entire process of scholarship. So open access, as we saw in the previous screen, typically refers to the outputs, the things that you write after you've done the whole research process, reporting on your results, but open science refers to that whole process. So that includes data, methods, publications, uh, analysis methods, you know, any software that you might use, all of that being open, free to read, keep and reuse, that's part of open research or open science. So you might hear open referred to in a lot of these different contexts. In all these contexts, it means roughly the same thing. That means it's completely free, 
to read, keep, and reuse, whatever the, the object is it's referring to. Now, why do we need open access in the first place? Well, I mentioned that if you're affiliated with a major research institution, typically your library will pay for your access to these things. And you might not be able to get it if you aren't affiliated with a major research institution or you don't have the money to pay it. But it's kind of a broader systemic problem. So universities or grants or research institutes will often pay scholars to do research. And then, of course, they want those scholars to report on what they found in that research. Well, typically how you report on that is you publish an article or you write a book. And the system as it stands now, when you publish, the scholars give away their articles and their copyright to that article to publishers for free. And it used to be really good to do this because the publishers would take care of typesetting and distribution and sending out all those individual hard copies to all the people who are interested in making sure those got to all the university libraries, for example. But now that can be done online and there's no more you know, postage fees, there's no more expensive printing needs. So you know, the, the, the copyright landscape has changed quite a bit. But the cost has just gone up. So the price for subscriptions to journals increases all the time every year, higher than inflation. Um, university budgets, I'm sure we all know, are increasingly tightening. And so it's a different landscape now. And publishers tend to rake in all the money. And what happens is that many people who really need the research can't get access to it. Libraries can increasingly afford fewer journals that their scholars use. And it's a, it's a kind of an unsustainable situation. So open access is a response to this, where we say we should actually change the model. We should make the products of scholarship free for anybody to read, reuse, and repurpose and, re and build upon and change the funding model. So we often talk about open, access publications and subscription publications. And I've got this wall of text on this slide here, but what is the real point of this slide is that when we're talking about open access journals or subscription journals, they really are very similar. They're both peer reviewed. They are both edited by established scholars. They're both general field journals, like say language or niche topics, like maybe semantics and pragmatics. They are affiliated with scholarly societies or different kinds of publishers. They're supported by foundations, library societies. But the difference really comes in how you access it. Is it free for all to read and reuse as in the case of open access uh, publications or subscription publications where you need to pay to access the article and you have limited or no reuse rights? So this is really the, the difference between the journals. A journal is still a journal. It just depends on how you get access to it. So a question I get all the time as a librarian is, how can open journals be free? Well, the answer is that they might not take in the, the revenue from subscriptions, but they can be supported by other business models. And I've got a big list of them here. And we'll hear a little bit more about how some of the specific journals are supported uh, in a little while here later in the presentation. But um, really, it's not that it's free to publish a journal, there's still costs involved, but the costs are, are acquired and the, the funding is acquired in various different ways. So here are some that you see here, and there's a really great uh, toolkit that was published earlier if you really wanna take a deep dive into this. You might also see this question uh, when you publish open access of a hybrid or open access option. So there are some subscription journals, and maybe you've run into this, where you get your article accepted, you've, you've gone through the peer review, it's ready to be published, and then you get an option where you can pay a fee to make your article, your singular article, open access. And that fee can range from a couple hundred dollars to several thousand dollars. This is often called hybrid open access, and some open access advocates call this double dipping, because what happens is the journal both charges subscription and open access fees. So they're making money off of two different areas. And it's especially bad when the journal does not, 
for example, if all the articles are paid for to be open access, then that journal doesn't drop their subscription fee. Um, this practice has happened in some cases, not all cases, but uh, it's kind of difficult to manage that. And it's really confusing for authors who suddenly get maybe charged a fee or maybe not. And it also is really confusing when it comes to complying with open access mandates that might be part of a grant or a university requirement. So you might see that this is totally typically called hybrid open access. It's something to keep an eye out for as well. So I mentioned open access mandates and grant requirements. So some institutions or funders have open access requirements built into their policies. If you've gotten a grant from any the the national agencies in the US, for example, you will have likely run into the need to publish your work or make it available open access. Uh, this has recently had a huge movement by a group of funders from the European Union called Coalition S. Uh, they have a very uh, very strong requirement for open access where you have to publish in open access journals and there's a bunch of other requirements. Some other funders just allow you to share copies of, of your articles in repositories after you publish. And we actually had a webinar from the LSA about last year at this time about how to use repositories and share copies of your work in this way. So check that link out if you need a primer on that topic as well. And you can also use this tool called uh, the Registry of Open Access Repository Mandates and Policies or Roar Map and see if your organization or your funder is listed there and you can find out more about what their policies are. It's a really handy tool. Now that you know what open access is, you might be interested in finding some open access content. Matt will talk in a moment about how to identify uh, open access journals and books a little bit more in depth. But if you're looking for something to read or looking for a place to get open access content, these two sources that I have here now, the Directory of Open Access Journals and the Directory of Open Access Books are two really great resources. They index lots of different subjects, many linguistics and language learning and language research in there. And all of these are openly available to anybody out there, two very good resources for finding open access content. Now the question also becomes, what happens if you're trying to find an article and you hit a paywall. So you get to the screen and maybe your library doesn't subscribe to the journal, or maybe you're one of these folks who's recently graduated or is between positions and you just don't have access to a library. Well, there's two tools that I recommend for finding openly available versions of work when you get to that screen that asks you to pay $39.95 or something for an article. So these two tools are called Unpaywall and the Open Access button. They're, they do slightly different things. And I've got some little demonstrations here for you. So these are GIFs showing Unpaywall in action. You can see that we got into a screen where we see an abstract. We want to read the article. This green lock shows. You click it, and it takes you to a copy. It's a, it's a post print, so it doesn't have the fancy formatting that might be in the journal, but it's got all the same content, so you can get the idea and then find out if you want to acquire that final published version. So this is Unpaywall. It's a browser extension that you can use. We also have the open access button, and here's an example where we are typing in a digital object identifier, and it searches, and it finds that same, this is the same article, uh, it finds that same post print copy that's available out there in the repository. So we can watch it one more time where you put in the digital object identifier, it searches for you, and there it is. And you'll note you can request it from the author. So if for some reason, this is one of the, the differences between open access button and on paywall, if the author hasn't made a copy available, or if there is no open access copy, you can request it from the author via the open access button. So it's another really useful tool for finding open access content. You can also find copies that are in repositories using Google Scholar. So here you see an example of looking up uh, an item in Google Scholar. And when you see that PDF from, you know, this is from Penn State, psu.edu, that means that there's a copy available in their repository and you can get a version of it available there. So look for that if you use Google Scholar, another way to find an open access copy. 
So that was just a brief overview of what open access is and how to find open access content. Now I want to turn it over to uh, panelist Matt Gordon, who will talk a little bit more about publishing open access. So I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over. So, um, yes, yeah, so thanks very much, Lauren, for that. So, um, as David said at the beginning, um, my name is Matt Gordon. I'm a professor at, in the linguistics department at UC Santa Barbara. Um, area of, of research, areas of research are um, phonetics, phonology, and typology, and you'll see some of those aerial interests creep into the presentation today. So, what I was going to do today was just talk a little about what you might do, how you might approach open access as a possibility when you're considering research ven venues for your work. So I'll talk about some of the factors to weigh as you make your choices about where to publish your work. Okay, so first I'll talk about generally just kind of echoing some of the sentiments Lauren expressed, why you might wanna choose open access. Um, there are a lot of advantages to it. Some of them Lauren already mentioned. Um, a big one is that you can make your research available to a much broader audience, namely because you're not confining yourself to people who have access to that work, and a lot of people won't for various reasons. So this obviously has the virtue of increasing the impact of your work. So if people don't have ac academic libraries that they can access, um, they'll still be able to get your work. Um, and if it's an institution that is unable or doesn't choose to subscribe to a particular journal, you'll still be able to get access to your work. I actually myself have um, a couple of articles that I can't access myself now. I mean, I could have, I suppose, if I request it, um, but I only have preprint copies because I don't have access to the final version. So it's nice if you can get access to everything you need for your own work. Um, the access will be a lot faster if it's open access and if you had to retrieve it from a journal or you might even have to order it if you do have access to an academic library through interlibrary loan. So you can avoid that by going open access. Um, there won't be any publication costs or they'll be reduced at least if you pursue an open access model and depending what uh, model is available for the uh, venue where you're um, sending your work. Um, another big advantage of course is that authors usually retain the copyright to their work under the open access model. So this means you can reuse figures, tables, and illustrations that you've prepared once. You can reuse them in future work. Um, you can republish full text in other volumes. Um, and you can also post your work on your website or other repositories, some of which Lauren mentioned earlier. Um, and also there's an overall kind of synergistic effect, you could say, um, by publishing your own work in open access, it kind of spreads a word and sets a template or model for others to follow. So this kind of furthers the general overarching endeavor of spreading the open access model. Okay, so now I'll um, just say a little about how you might choose an open access venue. So there are a lot of options. You saw a couple of the directories that Lauren showed links to on during her presentation. Um, so open access obviously is much larger than any one field um, or any one subfield within a broader field. So linguistics is no exception. So um, you can find open access outlets for all sorts of subfields within linguistics as well as in other fields, of course. Um, there are lots of different publication types. Um, Lauren mentioned those, um, journals, books, uh, edited volumes, proceedings, as well as the other repositories that I won't talk about so much where you might share your data. For example, the open science uh, framework um, provides a venue for that. So when you're thinking about where you might send your work or submit it or publish it, um, the same types of criteria that are relevant for choosing non-open access outlets also come into play when choosing where you might publish open access. Um, you'd wanna look at things like the fit between your research and the focus of the series or journal um, that you're um, considering. Um, another factor is obviously visibility. So how accessible is the journal gonna be to others and how known is it? How prominent is it? Um, the quality is obviously an important factor as well. So you can look at other articles or other research published in the open access venue you're considering. You can also look at the staff, the uh, editorial staff, the people associated with the journal, 
um, and that's a fair way to gauge how well respected and how prominent that, that open access venue is. Um, other practical considerations involve things like um, the timeline between submission and publication, what the general process is like, um, how often the open access venue publishes, so how productive are they. Um, there are other practical considerations involving cost because there are different types of open access models uh, that different journals and uh, publishers um, adopt, uh, and those will influence um, general practical uh, logistics of the process. You also might want to consult with others uh, in the field about various options, and by others in the field, this includes colleagues working in your particular, particular research area, as well as administrators, um, people who might be assessing your work and to see what they think. So turning next to um, various types of you know, case studies or practical um, uh, venues where we could publish them. So talked a little um, about types of work you might publish. So let's talk a little about types of journals, uh, journal examples that um, adopt an open access model. So the LSA actually has two platinum access open access journals. Um, which is the highest level of access. One of them is semantics and pragmatics, and the other is phonological data and analysis. That's the one I'm a co-editor of. Uh, and there are also conference proceedings that LSA publishes open access. In fact, pretty much all the content that open access that LSA publishes is open access. Um, and even the flagship journal language makes all content open access after one year and shorter under certain circumstances that David mentioned earlier. Um, there are a lot of other journals you can think about for open access uh, publications. Um, you saw Lauren uh, sent, have links to um, uh, databases listing these. Here's one that lists the um, journals that you might consider, and you can search using various filters to see what might be a good fit for your work. Uh, and also, this database includes information about specific journal practices and how they adhere to the open access principles. So here's a, one example of a journal that's open access. This is the one I mentioned earlier, Phonological Data and Analysis. Um, it was actually originally conceived of by one of our co-panelists today, Eric, who will be talking next. Um, so it was founded in 2013, originally as an online section of the journal language. And last year, it went, uh, uh, underwent a rebranding as a standalone journal published online. By LSA, so you can see the link if you want to check out phonological data and analysis. Um, and one of the um, you know virtues of this journal, besides it being open access, it serves uh, satisfies a niche in the field that re um, previously isn't wasn't met. Actually, it it's an outlet for publishing in-depth phonological treatments of data sets and data relevant for advancing the theory without without requiring a formal analysis. So it's really different from the other types of phonology journals that are out there. And then you can see um, the three editors, myself, Jean, and Buckley, and Megan Crowhurst. So that's one open access journal if you do any work involving phonology or sound more generally. Um, a little more about it, it's platinum open access. It's, uh, there are no fees for authors, readers, or libraries, and authors keep the copyright and publish it under um, CCBY license, which permits reuse um, generously. Um, the only condition for publication is that they all, uh, the authors are expected to be LSA members at the time of publication. Uh, and the financial support for PDA comes from membership dues for LSA, contributions to the LSA Open Access Publications Fund, as well as contributions from the editor's home institutions. Okay, another type of um, uh, work you might want to publish is a book, so something larger than a journal article. You can also do this online um, through open access venues. So there's an open access directory that has a list of publishers that will publish books. Um, and now you'd want to look through this carefully to see um, the conditions on open access imposed by the various publishers. Publication fees can vary. Um, some public uh, publishers of books do not publish uh, do not charge fees at all. I'll show one example of this in just a second. Uh, and others make a pledge to waive or reduce 
any fees associated with publication under certain circumstances. So one of these um, um, outlets for publishing books or monographs is the Language Science Press. Um, it publishes a wide variety of linguistics-related work, including edited volumes, books, grammars, and dictionaries. I should say that I think the, um, in particular, the grammars and dictionaries that they publish are particularly valuable to have those open access. There are very expensive grammar series, um, um, hard copy uh, grammars that you can buy. It's a great resource to have this, and I can say this as a typologist, someone who seeks out grammars to look at sound patterns across languages. This is a great resource. Um, it's got various features you can look into if you look at that website. But it, one thing, that, thing that's interesting is that it employs a community-based model of proofreading. So you can sign on as a proofreader and you get access to the work and you volunteer to proofread it, um, which is nice. You can never have uh, too many proofreaders, I think. Um, and you can see in this little graph here below that the number of submissions and publications to Language Science Press has increased rapidly over the last few years. Now there's uh, several hundred of them, and I expect that will grow in the future. Um, so that's um, all I was going to say. I'll now turn over the floor to Eric Bakovich, who will um, talk a little more about open access um, conventions and considerations. Great. Sorry, I'm going to share my webcam here and my screen. Okay, let me start the presentation. Um, thanks very much, Matt and Lauren uh, and David and all of you for attending. Uh, so as everybody said, I'm Eric Bakovich. I'm at UC San Diego. I'm a professor here. I've been here for about 20 years and I'm now uh, in my second year as chair of the department. So I'm speaking from that position. Um, I realized from the outset that a lot of the things that um, I may be talking about here based on my own use case have to do with the fact that I'm a senior scholar and in a position of relative privilege. Um, so I hope that some of the questions that some of you might ask uh, during the question period will ask about your particular use case, which may be different from any of ours. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about open scholarship a little bit more generally. Uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on first is uh, the concept of self-archiving. And the first thing I want to say about that is that there's an excellent prior LSA webinar on precisely this topic. There's the link right there. I believe Lauren also mentioned this webinar in her presentation. She's one of the panelists on that presentation. And it's a really excellent resource for more detail uh, than I'm able to talk about here. But let me touch on a few points um, that were also discussed in that webinar. Um, so self-archiving just means keeping a record of your own work uh, independently of whether you publish in an open access journal. Uh, so one thing you might want to use um, to publicize your work is a discipline or a subject-specific repository, or, or both. Uh, and I've given you some examples of ones that are relevant to linguistics. There's many more. These are just some of the ones that I'm familiar with that fit on this slide. The first that I'm most intimately familiar with is the Rutgers Optimality Archive which I used to be the manager for. Uh, there's also something called the Semantics Archive, which is now managed by the Linguistic Society of America. Uh, there's LingBuzz, which many of you may be most familiar with. It's kind of the more general purpose, um, kind of broadly linguistic um, repositories out there. Uh, there's also a relatively new one called SciArchive. It's specific to psychology, but there's a lot of, of course, psycholinguistics and related work in there. And the list probably goes on and on. There is an open access, um, uh, an open directory of open access repositories that I give you the link for right there on the right. Um, I, <laughs> I can't believe I didn't notice this before, but last night when I was putting this uh, bit together, I was like, oh, I should go to that repository and see if the Rutgers Optimality Archive is on there. And nope, it's not. And so I submitted it as a suggestion just last night. So you may not find it on that list. So these um, directories are not managed in such a way that everything is captured uh, necessarily. So the owners of these archives need to um, get, or these repositories need to get in touch with that open directory in order to get things listed. And so my bad, I never did that until last night. Um, 
let me just give you an example of a couple of uh, these things, if I can exit out of my screen here. Whoops, there we go. Um, so this is what the Rutgers Optimality Archive looks like right now. It's currently being managed by the Rutgers libraries. Uh, for a while, it was just being managed by people in linguistics at Rutgers University, and that's where I went to grad school. And as you can see here, you can search either the full text or for authors, titles, and various other things. And it gives you a listing of recent submissions. There's currently about 1,300 submissions on there. Um, I did a search for my own name and it shows you all the articles that have my name on here. Uh, the dates aren't listed because on some of these because there was a transfer to another database service um, at some point that lost a lot of information. But uh, I can tell you that this first paper was from 1995. So I've been posting my work onto the Rutgers Optimality Archive whenever it's relevant to optimality theory um, since I was a grad student. Um, another type of repository that you can use as I mentioned here, is uh, an institution uh, repository. My institution is the University of California, and our uh, repository is called eScholarship that um, has open access publications from the University of California. And if you search for my name on there, then you get this list of things that I've posted to uh, my institutional repository, many of which are also the things that I've posted to the Rutgers Optimality Archive. So there's a lot of duplication here. Um, now that duplication, I think, is good. This is what I say in my last bullet point here. Don't be shy about using multiple repositories. Um, redundancy is a good thing. Not only does it make it easier for somebody to find your work, but also if any one of these um, repositories goes down for some reason or is taken down for some reason, then there's another copy available somewhere else. Um, there is a service run out of Stanford called um, Lots of Copies Keeps Things or Keeps Stuff Safe which the acronym is LOCKS with two S's. Um, and there are some repositories that participate in the LOCKS system and they purposely make copies and mirrors of lots of different things so that things won't get lost. So you can do that yourself as well. And, um, kind of related to the self-promotion side of things, if you're archiving work, it's because you want people to read it. So there's a certain aspect of promotion of your work, not just of yourself, but of your work. Um, and uh, for this purpose, there are some other ways in which you can promote yourself, and that's by using services like academia.edu and ResearchGate. Um, there are lots of pros and cons here. I'm just going to give you my personal opinion. I advise you to avoid these repositories because they're commercial and their purpose is not to share work but to make money. And at a certain point, they're going to be either making money or selling them off for parts. Uh, there's a link here to a University of California um, Office of Scholarly Communication blog post that was written back in 2015 about these sites. They're essentially social networking sites. And don't be fooled by the .edu at the end of academia. They were grandfathered in before there were restrictions on the use of that, um, of that URL. Um, so they're really Academia Inc. Um, so you're really kind of selling your uh, data to a commercial enterprise when you post your work uh, or have accounts on here. I realize that this is the way a lot of people share their work and to get access to some of that work, you need to be a member or to join up, but I would advise you to use the same caution you'd use for signing up to any commercial enterprise when signing up to, for either of these uh, commercial repositories. Um, one of the better things to do, I think, is to maintain a professional website. You know, the first hit when somebody does a search for you, assuming that you have a distinguishable enough name or that they put linguistics after it or something like that, the first hit should be to your site, your professional site, not to your Facebook site, not to your academia.edu site, unless that is your professional site, but to your own site. And I just went ahead and uh, brought up mine. This is the work page on my website where I have my research area sort of categorized into general sets and I have recent manuscripts here, and all of these links either go to the actual publication or to a postprint that's available somewhere, usually and to one of the repositories where I post them. And if you follow any one of these links, it takes you to um, different works. So I'll just follow one of these, my work on opacity and other things, and I have a listing of other publications here, including a book, and where it's possible to make um, copies available, those that are open access, I have links to them. Um, this takes a while to do, of course, and to manage, um, but I think it's well worth your time, especially if you're a junior scholar, you're just getting started out, 
that's you have less to do now and then every time you publish something or you make it available put it on multiple repositories put a link on your website and then move on i really think that's a very good idea um, another thing you can do is to get an ORCID, which is a, um, a unique identifier for your research work. Here's my public page on the ORCID website. Um, it has information about my employment, looks kind of like a social networking site in certain respects, um, things about my education, and then works that I have posted here. I only have 20 of my um, papers posted on here, but I'm you know slowly adding them because I've only recently joined ORCID recently, and then I became a chair, so I have no time to do these things. Um, but I've been doing it, and I think it's a good idea. It's another way for people to find your work. And then it's always associated with your ORCID ID, which is a unique identifier for you. Uh, so if anybody's working, looking for other work by you, especially if your name is confusable with somebody else's name, um, this is an easy way for people to identify your body of work. And then finally, I would give in this in this uh, section here about self-promotion, I would uh, advise everybody to take control of your online presence and reputation. There's a lot of stuff that happens online and a lot of things that we do. Um, and a lot of this can affect the way that your um, image as an academic is presented to the world. Uh, again, I give you a, a link to a, a blog post on the Office of Scholarly Communication website that's specifically about reputation management and your identity. Um, this was done by our scholarly communications librarian here at UC San Diego, Allegra Swift, um, so kind of the counterpart of uh, Lauren, who's at uh, Pitt. I really advise you in particular to find out if you have a scholarly communications librarian. They're usually really well informed and really willing to help. Um, so these are good people to get in touch with if you have any questions about any of these things. Okay, one other thing that I wanted to mention is data sharing. Um, so this is kind of like a broader open um, scholarship type of practice. And this is a very complicated area for some people. Um, you might be wondering, well, what kind of data are you able to share or do you really want to share with other people? Um, the types of data that you can be shared, at least in principle, are raw data that you collect from experiments or from field work, for instance. These might be audio video recordings or various other types of things. Um, other materials, so like the scripts that you use for your um, experiments or some questionnaires that you used in gathering data. Um, or you, there might be code, code that you used for your experiment, code that you use for analysis. Any of these things can in principle be shared. If you do share them, I recommend using a, a service that is specifically designed for sharing uh, data and that will allow you to organize it in a principled way Two, just two that I mentioned here at the right are Databrary, which is um, funded for having a large amount of space for sharing, in particular, video data. And there's also the Open Science Framework, or OSF. Uh, and the Open Science Framework is kind of a larger framework of um, ways in which you can share your work. And it really organizes all of your projects in such a way that um, you can do things like share data, share materials, share code, share papers once they're done. And you can do this all privately with your research group. And then when you're ready to share everything, you can just convert that into something public. Now you may be asking, why should I share all this? Well, uh, one of the um, benefits of sharing is that you're helping others by being more inclusive about what it takes to be a researcher in your area. Um, up until recently, the only way you found out about what counts as data and what counts as good research is to be a member of a particular lab or a particular research group that does that research. By sharing your data, you make it possible for other people to figure out how to be a member of your research group uh, or of your type of research um, community. Um, the other thing is helping science. So replicability or rep reproducibility of experiments um, is or of analyses is very important for the advancement of science. It can also identify mistakes that you may have made. Those may be embarrassing, but better to correct the record than to have that mistake be carried on into uh, future work. And it's also um, kind of paradoxically a way of protecting yourself and your reputation. You're being completely transparent about what data informed your analysis, um, and you can stand behind your data much more um, uh, strongly, or at least stand behind the ability for others to poke holes in it if there are any holes in it. So those are all, I think, good reasons for wanting to share data. 
Um, a little bit more about Open Scholarship and then I'll be done. Uh, one other thing that Open Scholars um, participate in is something called pre-registration or registered reports. These are two technically different things. I give you a link to a, a psychological science article that uh, talks about these things. A pre-registration is basically laying out what your study is going to be about and how you're going to go about analyzing it before you actually carry out the study. And the reason why this was brought up as a thing to do in open scholarship is because sometimes what ends up happening when you don't do this is you gather the, you design the study, you gather the data, you find out that the approach you were going to use before isn't quite going to work. And so you massage things a little bit later and then present it as if that was your intention all along. And sometimes that's fine, but sometimes that can border on not fraudulent necessarily, but uh, a, a kind of bad design. It can hide a bad design behind a study. And so pre-registration forces you to sort of organize things, make sure that you know what you're doing before you carry out the study, and therefore you can be more confident in the results. Now registered reports are something different. Uh, registered reports are pre-registration, but you submit that pre-registration to a journal, and then it's reviewed, and then it's accepted at that point, then you conduct the study and the paper is basically already accepted no matter how the study turns out because the registered report has already been peer reviewed and commented on and presumably improved upon because of that peer review process. That's something we're not so used to in linguistics perhaps, but those of you who are doing more psycholinguistically uh, oriented research and maybe even other types of research in the future will be um, increasingly doing this sort of thing. Um, so the takeaway here, I think, is that more openness requires more organization. It takes a lot of work up front, but it's well worth it later on because later on you'll be able to not encounter mistakes and have to make up for them. Those mistakes will be taken care of um, um, in advance, and so your work can be more solid. At least this is what I hear from people who engage in this type of thing. And then finally, what I would advise is that if you have any questions about how producing or um, following more open scholarship uh, principles and processes is going to affect your career. Um, the thing to do is to talk with your advisor if you're a graduate student, talk with your mentor if you're a young faculty member and have a mentor, and if you don't have one, get one. Uh, make sure that there's a mentorship program within your department. Talk with your chair uh, or talk with your dean about the value of open. Uh, the main things I think holding open access and other open scholarship practices back our ignorance of what it means and a mistaken belief that the current system ain't broke. And uh, as Lauren pointed out at the very beginning, there was a lot of aspects of the current system that are broke. And so more open scholarship practices would be welcome. Anyway, that's it for me. And I'll turn it back over to, I guess, David. Okay, uh, thanks to all the panelists. And um, now we come to the question and answer portion of the webinar. Uh, remember to ask your questions by raising your hands virtually on the GoToWebinar dashboard. There should be a little hand icon on the left that you can uh, use to ask a question. And I will enable your microphone so that you can ask it. And uh, remember, if your question is for a specific panelist, go ahead and, and specify that. Um, okay, so we're ready for questions. And we did have a couple of write-ins also, so I'm actually going to start uh, with one of those. But those of you in the audience, don't be shy and do raise your hands. Um, so uh, someone said, uh, my open access journals, some open access journals ask me to pay, pay to publish. Is that legitimate? I could take this. Go ahead, yeah. I'll, I'll do this. Um, yes, uh, in many cases. So. Uh, I had a slide way back when about models, uh, business models for open access. And one of those business models is uh, author fees or article processing charges, sometimes abbreviated as APCs. And uh, that's a business model that has gained a lot of traction, especially in the physical and medical sciences, not so much in the humanities and social sciences. And the reason for that is because a lot of um, engineering or biomedical research is often grant funded and those grants will pay for these article processing fees that is not so much the case in say linguistics so um, you will see some journals asking you to pay to publish if that is a uh, 
an open access journal that has the same fee for everybody. They have it publicly listed somewhere. If it's upon acceptance and not submission, that's an important part. Um, that, is, that is a legitimate business model used by many journals. Um, if you do run into that situation, uh, if you have a grant, you might ask your grant for money to cover it. Many university libraries have funds that you can apply for to pay for that fee. Um, some departments will cover that fee. Um, and there are also waivers for people who aren't affiliated with major institutions or who are from uh, other situations where money might not be so readily available. So yeah, that can be legitimate. Um, it's a business model used a lot, but sometimes it, if, especially if it's payment upon submission, that is when I would question whether it's legitimate or not. Mm -hmm. okay, um, uh, if I I'm sorry, oh, sorry, can I add on to that for a sec? Um, I, I think, yes, the APCs are a legitimate business model, exactly as Lauren said. Um, but I also think you want to gauge, you know, how you're getting the request, right? If you're getting a request mm -hmm. that seems to be bombarded to a bunch of people and says, hey, submit your work, all you have to do is pay a couple of thousand dollars and we'll publish. That's the, the CD side of it, right? Um, but that's not what phonological data and analysis is going to do, right? Or well, you don't charge an article processing charge. But there are some journals that do have a modest or sometimes a high article processing charge. And the fact is that they cost money to publish. It's not something that is free. So even though we rail against these big publishers who charge too much for their services, such as they are, um, it's not the case that it should be absolutely free because it costs nothing to do this work. So there has to be some way to pay the bills, and one way to do it is through um, article processing charges. And so I, I, everything else that Lauren said, totally agree with. I just wanted to make that particular wrinkle uh, clear. If you're getting a request from some journal you've never heard of, and it just sounds like you're going to give them money and they're going to publish your work, don't do that. And if there's ever any question, you can always try to look up the journal in the directory of open access journals. That's a really reliable listing of good open access journals. If they're not in there, I wouldn't trust them. Yep. Thanks. And I see some people are asking questions using the questions widget, which is um, just fine. I'll read those uh, out to the panelists. So again, if you ask your question that way and it's for somebody, a particular panelist, just um, let us know. So I will start off with this one. Um, can I put older and therefore not open access papers into a repository? Yes, please. <laughs> um, it depends though, right? I mean, Lauren can probably answer this question much more um, informally than me, but what I, as I understand it, if you have, if the journal you've published in before um, has a policy of allowing you to post either the publisher's final version after a certain embargo period, or at least your author's final version, uh, which many, if not most, good linguistics journals do have a policy more or less consistent with this, um, then you can, you can make your older work available even if it wasn't open access to begin with. Definitely. Check out that um, webinar from last year that Eric linked to um, from a totally deep dive in how to do this, but a really easy way to find out if you can post a prior version of an older paper is to use a, a tool called Sherpa Romeo, and that's a really tortured acronym for something. Um, but it's a it's a search engine for publisher copyright policies, and uh, it's you just type in the name of the journal, and it brings back what you can post and what you can't post. It's very handy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Here's uh, the next question. Academia.edu has been criticized fairly, I must say, in this talk. What other options are there for us, junior scholars, to share not only our publications, but also conference slides, for instance? Ah, good question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I mean, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Lauren, go ahead. I would say the first thing, if you're affiliated with an institution, see if you have an institutional repository. So at Pitt, ours is called the scholarship at Cal, you see it's e-scholarship, I believe, right? Um, so this is probably housed by your library and they can point you in the right direction. So that would be my first go-to. And the cool thing about institutional repositories is they not only take journal articles, but they'll also take conference posters and presentations most often as well. So you can post all kinds of stuff in there and uh, that would be my first go-to. Eric, did you have another suggestion? No, that was exactly it. But I, I was gonna say also, you know, if you maintain your right. place where you can post all of your work, 
The disadvantage with using your own website, um, it depends on how you manage it, but one of the disadvantages is it's not necessarily going to um, have a um, digital object identifier associated with what you post on there. And so one of the advantages of using an institutional repository or something that has that kind of infrastructure is that it will give it a, um, a unique identifier that makes it possible for, for people to find the work more easily. And it goes into like different uh, ways of um, accessing your work. Um, whereas putting it on your website, you're just putting it in your website and counting on people being able to find that. Um, one way that I've seen people get around this a little bit is, uh, and I've never done this before, but just out of laziness more than anything, is to get a URL that you're going to just pay for for the rest of your life that is your name or something like that so that it's not changing every time you're um, changing institutions and therefore the links are breaking or whatever. As long as you know how to do that and maintain your website, that might be a way of circumventing some of the problems. but. Like I said with, in my presentation, on my website, most of the links to my papers go to my institutional repository or somewhere where there is a permanent copy of the paper kept. Another a third option here is a subject archive. So uh, Eric mentioned a few of those. So Sci Archive, if you do any kind of psycholinguistic research, there's Soch Archive, S-O-C mm. Archive, which is for mm. social sciences, more sociology based. Uh, there's a variety of linguistics preprint servers, but there's also really general uh, places you can post. So one example is Figshare. Um, and another one is Zenodo, which is really a data kind of repository, but it, I mean, you can post anything there and it gives a DOI. So, you know, there's a bunch of different options. Some are institutions, some are fields, some are more general. So depending on your situation, uh, then one might be the best choice for you. I'll add one more thing here, just because you mentioned some of these services. The services are great, but if, if what you're concerned about with academia.edu is the commercial aspect of it, the other thing you might need to think about is whether these um, different services are actually positioning themselves to sell themselves to a publisher. So many of us were found out at, at one point a couple of years ago that BE Press was sold to Elsevier. And many of us were using, including me, was were using that to have our work. And I basically had to spend a few days taking my work down from there and putting it in my institutional repository, something I had, been, I had intended to do anyway, but because it had become this commercial enterprise. You can trust your institutional repository not to do that. I don't think you can trust um, some of the other kind of more commercial looking type of enterprises to do that. That happened to SSRN to the Social Sciences That's Research right. Network That's some, right. some years yeah. before B Press. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, here's another question. Um, are open access journals considered to have lower reputations? I've heard they aren't as rigorous. Will it hurt my chances to get an academic job if I only have open access publication? No. no. <laughs> but you can this look, is a tough one, though. Yeah, if you Go look ahead. at, I mean, I think if you scout out various venues you're thinking of, I think you can easily get a sense of that based on what's published there and who's associated with the journal. Um, but I don't, there's, I don't think there's any sense nowadays in which there's lower prestige attached to the whole platform of open access. Yeah. Now, Eric, this might be for you. I know some departments will have sort of lists of recommended journals. Yes. And if there's not an open access one on there, what would you advise somebody do? Well, I, this is this is a complicated thing. It's something that I'm actually, as chair, trying to institute in my own department because it's just not a question we've considered before. We always just think, oh, we know what all the good journals are, but this landscape changes all the time regardless of the open access question, right? So just to give you all one example, uh, the entire editorial board of an Elsevier journal named Lingua in 2015 resigned from that and started a new journal called Glossa. Many, many of you may already know about this, um, but what's interesting about that particular case is that the reputation that Lingua had before is now the reputation that Glossa has. And it's even better because it's open access. I think many in linguistics think that that adds to its reputation um, because there was a, uh, an effort to get themselves away from the bad practices that Elsevier has. Um, but if you know there's a list of journals in your department and they had Lingua on there before and nobody updated it after 2015, then that could be a problem. And this is one of those situations where it's a good idea to talk with your advisor, your chair, your mentor, your dean, and say, look, 
this journal used to be good, but then it its entire editorial board, which is what made it good, moved over to this other platform. And that's what we're calling quality now. Um, open access journals are not any different than regular subscription journals. They're just open access. That's the only difference. Now, there's a lot of misinformation about that, and sometimes it requires talking to people about it, but I don't think having a bank of open access publications is going to hurt your chances at advancing your career at all. Are there other questions? David? Sorry, I had my microphone muted. Okay. Um, <laughs> another one talking about the fee to publish some workarounds have been mentioned but doesn't it restrict the access of authors to publication we want to open research to all readers but aren't we limiting publication at the same time yes so this is my personal belief so i'm taking off sort of my official hat here but um i think that especially because open access week the question is open for whom and about equity if you really just shift the the restriction from who can read to who can participate and write and publish that doesn't change the the it changes the dynamic a little bit but it doesn't make it much better so notably i just saw a this is not linguistics but i saw a a, a post from the public library of science plus which is a big mega science journal it's one of the first big open access journals out there they had an article processing charge and they had a post about today where they were saying we need to rethink this model because this is really restricting people's ability to participate in the system of scholarship and science and if that huge journal that covers such a huge depth of field is starting to reconsider i think that bodes really well for many folks reconsidering that as well yeah uh, i'll add to that that many of these journals that have these um, open access uh, article publishing charges uh, or article processing charges uh, they will have waivers for people who ha are in uh, would have difficulty paying for that um, article processing mm -hmm. charge. And so they build that into the system. That doesn't necessarily make it perfect, of course, because people might not be aware of the waivers or how to apply for them or anything like that. So it still might be restrictive, but at, at least it's an effort on the part of uh, these journals who know that they have to pay the bills, have figured out that this is the best way for them to pay the bills, um, but know that that's going to restrict access in some way and so have an out uh, for that restriction and access. Do, do any of uh, the rest of you have uh, in the audience have questions? Okay, we do have a question here. Um, it says there, uh, so wait, sorry, here we go. Um, in your experience, can we deposit stuff in our institutional repository even if we didn't conduct that research at this institution or, or we weren't even at uh, any institution? Yes. Yes. So that's our policy here at the University of Pittsburgh with our repository. If you want to deposit your dissertation that you did at your graduate institution, you can do that as long as you have the rights to. Um, you know, we're happy to, as Eric mentioned, lots of copies keep stuff safe. So we are happy to uh, have multiple copies of things as long as it's okay and as long as everybody has the permission to do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing I'll add to that is that if, you're, um, if your institution has an open access policy, as many institutions now increasingly do, then you may be technically required to post your work after the policy was put into place on your institutional repository. Um, but there's two exceptions to that. One is if you weren't at the institution when you published the paper, then you're not required to do so. And if it's anything before the date when the open access policy was put in place, you're not required to do so. But you're always allowed, at least at most institutional repositories that I know, if you're affiliated with the institution, then you can put your entire body of work up there, um, as long as it's following um, the, um, as long as it's consistent with whatever publishing agreements you, you've signed and with your open access policy. Sorry, here's another question. 
I can accept that open access journals are as respectable as other journals, but my university library is encouraging us to publish textbooks, OER, and I'm worried about whether that really involves good peer review. Yeah, um, OER is something that I'm working on here at my library as well. Um, it's about, you may, the person who asked this may be hearing about a college affordability and, you know, student success. So, um, it kind of depends on how how you do the publishing. So there are some organizations like the Open Textbook Network and OpenStax that help with peer review of open textbooks, and many of them follow very similar processes to to sort of um, uh, like commercially published textbooks and you know university press type textbooks. Um, so it just depends on what organization you go with. Of course, anybody can like write something and put it in a PDF and post it on the internet. That doesn't mean that it's a, a good textbook, but the, if you work with your librarians to identify um, whether maybe they're working with the Open Textbook Network or they're working with one of these organizations that is doing uh, peer review, then I think uh, you know that can be a, a really great way to get you know, more students access to educational materials as well. And this is one of those allied concepts to open access that is gaining more and more traction. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep adding things to everything, but I, I wanna add something because I feel very strongly about this one too. Um, uh, I think like Lauren said, a lot of it depends on exactly how the review process is done or even if there is one. I mean, the, just let you in on a dirty little secret. There's even commercial publishers publish textbooks that go through very minimal peer review. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they send it out to a couple of people, promise them a few hundred dollars in books, and somebody sends in, oh yeah, this looks good. I'd use it in my class, and then that thing might get published. Um, so surprise, surprise, that's sometimes the way peer review of some book length things work. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily mean that open access or open educational resources need to work that way. If you were interested in writing a book, a textbook, and um, it's something that your department will consider as something that is of, um, worthy of something that you can, can be considered for promotion, then perhaps what you could do is plan from the outset to have it be an open educational resource, share it at, along the way as you're producing it with a bunch of colleagues, get them to submit public reviews of it, and then submit that with your tenure packet or whatever it is that you're submitting. If you have more documentation of what peer review you actually went through, that might be better than saying, oh, well, I published it with such and such a press, so obviously it must have gone through some kind of process. And some of these groups like OpenStax will um, publish those peer reviews alongside the books, so you can read what other people thought of it. And the fact that it's going to be available on the internet means that it's a living document. You, if somebody gives you some feedback that can improve the book, you can change it um, rather than waiting for you know the next edition, which will come out maybe never, maybe in 15 years, whatever it is. Okay, here's another one. Um, where can one find post-print copies of one's own articles? Does one have to ask the journals for them? Uh, good question. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you kept it. <laughs> this is the version that um, typically you got those peer reviews, you did the review, you did the revisions, and then you sent it back into the journal and the editor went, yep, looks good. Um, hopefully, you know, you have that still around somewhere or can access it through going into the journal. Um, for those that, that didn't keep that, asking might help. Uh, what do you two think? Have you got any strategies for this? I've actually have a couple I mentioned earlier that uh, a couple of things that um, a couple of people have asked me for and I and I realize oh actually I don't have that for submitting it with a you know merit review or whatever mm -hmm. um, so I just choose preprints I'm sure I could get it if I asked but um, I just haven't taken the time to so I don't know maybe I wouldn't wouldn't be a sure thing I don't know <laughs> Uh, personally, I've been so obsessive compulsive about these things all my life that I have it all filed away and so I can find a postprint and a preprint and the first draft of almost every paper that I've written probably somewhere. Um, but uh, in the event that you don't have your postprint, um, sometimes the publisher, if they're a good actor in this space, 
will, upon request, send you a post print if you tell them what you're planning on doing with it and as long as it's consistent with their, um, with their uh, whatever their copyright or publishing um, um, principles or, or processes are. I've also had good luck with this with book chapters. I've helped a couple of faculty here at Pitt request copies of book chapters that they've written that could be posted in the institutional repository. And usually the, the publisher will send back like a, a nice page proof of it with a sort of watermark across the page. So if you are looking for a postprint of a book chapter, that's uh, something that seems to, to get a good response from publishers as well. And um, all right, so let's see, does anybody else have uh, questions? Again, you can use the questions widget or the, um, or the little hands icon, whichever you prefer. Okay, um, any other questions for now? Is there anything that, uh, that any of the panelists would like to add? I just want to give one more pitch for the Committee on Scholarly Communication and Linguistics. If you like this stuff, join our committee or, uh, you know, tell your friends to join the committee if they're also interested in these things. We uh, are looking for new members to do more stuff like this, more educational outreach and more um, helping other LSA members find good open access and good open scholarship resources and share their work and do all kinds of cool things. So mm -hmm. one more pitch. And I'd make one more pitch to um, talk to people about open access, you know, talk to your peers, talk to your colleagues above you, talk to colleagues under you, um, because the more information that is shared, I think, in the spirit of open access, the more people will realize, oh, open access is just like subscription, except better, um, and better in all of these respects that we talked about today. And I think that, um, the more conversations we have about that, the more types of questions that we um, have been talking about at the end of this webinar will uh, just address themselves because more people will be participating in this system. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And then it kind of brings to the forefront the goal of making material open access. The more you um, ask questions about it, people start to think about it more and then you can engage in discussions that will further it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so uh, again, just, uh, sorry, just a moment. Um, okay, sorry, sorry about that. Um, many thanks again to all of you panelists for sharing your time and your expertise with us. And uh, many thanks to all of you in the audience for taking the time of, out of your day to be with us. Um, We'll have a recording of this webinar available no later than Monday, and we'll let you know when it's ready. And uh, if you'd like to support the LSA, LSA's open access initiatives, um, please click the donate link at the top of www.linguisticsociety.org and select the open access publications fund from the drop down uh, menu. If you're an LSA member, log into the website first, and all your um, demographic information will pre populate the donation form. Um, thanks again, everybody, especially to our panelists, uh, but also to our audience, and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank yeah. you. See you all later. Bye-bye, everyone.